Welcome to the Grand Point Church Podcast. I'm your host, Crystal Stein, and today we're starting a new message series called Made to Be. God is one of a kind with no beginning and no end, and everything God has created is unique and one of a kind, including people created in His image. Every person is an original reflection of God, and our individuality is a reflection of the character of God. Most people live with an image issue that's diminished, distorted, or derailed. The idea of being created in the image and likeness of God is overlooked or misunderstood, leaving us with an image created from our own perspective or experiences. Today we're revealing the foundational truth about our image and how that truth informs our values and mission for life. If you'd like to follow along with today's message from Pastor Kevin Elworth, our feature verses come from Genesis 1, 26 to 28. I want to take you today, we're starting this series called Made to Be, and over the next few weeks, five weeks or so, whether it's me or somebody else, we're going to talk about um, this idea of made to be, and we're going to discover today that we're made in the image of God. And so this is uh, together with our Kids Point crew, we're all working on this at the same time and in the same place, and um, That's really important for you to know and understand because what you're going to receive today, you can then take home and back up with your kids, and that is awesome. Right, Logan? Mm Mm-hmm. I want to take you to John, 1 John chapter 1, chapter 3, my bad. 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to start there, and then we're going to get into this idea of uh, made in the image of God that comes from Genesis chapter 1. So we're going to be all over the map today. If you've got a Bible, um, it's going to smoke today, but if not, just write some of this stuff down because you'll probably want to come back to it later. John says this, he says, look at the wonder and the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. Have you seen that? I got one witness. Have you, look at it. He says, look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has just spilled out over you. Do you, do you walk in that, in that part of life? Have you seen it? Like, I think there's some elements, like, some of you are like, yes, emphatically, I have it. Others of you are like, not quite so sure that's where I live or that's what I'm seeing. I, I got to be honest with you, if you're not seeing what he's talking about right there, look with wonder at the depth of the marvelous love that God has lavished on us. If you can't see that, then you need to change what you're looking at. Because you're just not, you're not looking in the right place. You're not looking at the right thing because he makes it very emphatically clear that he has an incredible love for you in the condition that you're in today. You are good enough. It's good. He goes on to say this. He says, he has called us and he's made us his very own beloved children. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. They're, they're stuck in this peculiar trap. Like, what are we looking at? He says this, beloved, we are now God's children right now. However, it is not yet apparent what we will become, but we do know that when it is finished, when it is finally visible, we will be just like him for we will see him as he truly is. Man, I look forward to that day. Like all the mystery is gone. Like all the questions answered and all who focus their hope on him will be purifying themselves just as Jesus is pure. I love that last line. And all who focus their hope on him. So, like, we're just in my pre-intro here. (laughs) Not even introducing introducing yet. Just pre-introducing, okay? But he says, all who focus their hope on him. Where, Where is your hope focused? Like, in, like answer, just in your mind, where is your hope focused today? Now, let me give you a relatable. So this week, we had this really important doctor's appointment, and we've just gone from one appointment to the next appointment, and that's really all that we can do, one to the next. And so Tuesday morning, we got up, went to this, and I, I can't share all the details because it wouldn't be good. I might say some words I shouldn't say. Um, I had to surrender my pastor's car this week at one point. It was bad. <laughs> So we're here, we're at this doctor's appointment. This doctor walks through, he's like, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. This is the hope that we're, this is what we're looking for. He did this three times. Told me, the same thing, three times. Escorts me out of the room. Crystal's there on this table in this freezing cold room where she's going to get a CT scan. And I go in this waiting room and they come back 10 minutes later. The guy comes and gets me 10 minutes later and he's like, I need to talk to you and your wife. And so I come back in, I'm like, oh, that was really fast, this is amazing. And, and he's like, we're not going to take this test. 
I'm like, I beg your pardon? Now, I, for those of you who know me well, I'm pretty reserved and quiet and not very offensive. But something like just came over me in that moment. And uh, that's where I put my card down. And I, I, I looked at this little doctor, like this tall, and I said, I told him this. I said, do you realize you're taking away my hope right now? You just robbed my wife of her hope because we have gone from appointment to appointment and you just told me that you aren't going to do what we've asked you to do or what another doctor asked you to do. And his whole thing was like, well, you need to set up an appointment with Hershey and go that route. And I'm like, yeah, because, you know, everybody can just call Hershey and demand a CT scan. What is this, Mexico? Because you can do that there. Not here. But what I, what I recognized was a super profound truth because, where's my verse? All who focus their hope on Him. Like your, folk, your, your hope can't, is, can't be focused on anything but on, on that one thing because when we, as soon as we focus our hope on anything less than that, we are bound for disappointment every single time. And, and I want to inspire you today. You've got to begin to focus your hope on the one thing that's always hopeful. He will never change that. Now, let me, uh, let's dive into this image this image of Christ thing. So um, for those of you who, who also know us, and I know that we're still introducing ourselves to some of, we've got some new people here all the time. Our family, we've got five kids and four of them have been adopted, right? Y'all know this, some of you. And, and so great, wonderful, blessed children. I have to say that because one of them's here listening to me. Um, but it was really ironic. As, after we adopted our first two, Grayson and Ryder, People would tell us that, that they would just meet our family. And they'd be like, oh, they look just like you. I'm like, do they? Sweet. That's awesome. We would just run with it. Every, we, every time we just run with it. Yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. They're, not part of our, they're not part of us at all. But sure. sure. And, and then as we continually added you know, more to our family, it became clear as they stand at a distance that something's off here. And that's where I pull in my like, well, they all have different fathers phrase. <laughs> That's my favorite one. And then they, every time, it's, they try not to, but they look at Crystal. <laughs> that is so funny. They're trying so hard to figure it out, and they can't get there. Sometimes I'll let them in. Most of the time I won't, because it's just, it's just really funny to watch them wrestle with this reality. But um, we can get off with pretending like they're all ours, and they all look like us, until they see Ellie, and they're like, nope. That happened, and the little black girl just throws it off. But <laughs> what what I recognize over time is that at they be, they do actually begin to look like us, not physically, but their character begins to look like who we are. It's not the fact that they look like an Elworth; it's that they have the characteristics of our family. Why? Because we begin that we live in this proximity where they're watching us and they're learning from us and they're adding to their lives the things that they've seen us do, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Let me just advocate for you as a parent. Your kids are watching everything you do and say. It's not in the appearance that we're similar, but it's in the character. And the more time I spend with the kids, the more that they look like me. And there's no difference in your relationship with God. The more that you spend time with Him, the more you begin to look just like Him. Let me take you to Genesis chapter 1, where Moses wrote these words. And he says in Genesis 1, verse number or something, I don't even know. God said, now we will make humans and they will be like us. Now, I just want to take that first line right there because there's, some, there's something peculiar in that because just the line before this, and this is all Genesis chapter 1, and he, so he's going through the events of creation, and every time it says, and God said, and he created, and God said, let there be, and God said this, and then there's this one where it's like right before this, in verse number 24, I think it's written that um, God said, I will bring forth animals, and they will blah, 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 whatever he says, right? And, and so we know that God rested on the seventh day. Yeah. This is the sixth day. He's creating all of this stuff. He's finally, he's putting his exclamation point on it, because right after this, he's going to say that it was very good. And I, I just think that there's this 15-minute break that God takes, you know, 
coffee break right here between animals and people. Because he goes and has this little conference with the rest of the Trinity. And they decide together, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that now we are going to make humans and they will be like us. So I guess my question is, is like, what does that mean? What does it mean that God said they will be like us? Does that mean that we look like God? Does it mean that we get to be like God? One scholar theorized it this way, that God created man as his image, so that no matter where on earth people would eventually wander, they would be a representation of God and Christ everywhere on earth. Bet you never looked at people that way before. You, you do realize that I know, because I am a person, there's some people that you like, there's some people that you love, and there's some people that you loathe. But every one of them is created in the image of God. Let's go on. He says, we will let them rule the fish and the birds and all the other creatures. So he gives them purpose. And so God created humans to be like himself. He made them man and woman. And he goes on and he says, and he gave them this blessing. Have a lot of children. And some of you need to step it up. I really want to know, like, what did he mean by a lot? Quantify that for me. <laughs> Am I missing the mark? Or are we there? Are we close? You know what I mean? 72 kids. Let me just like pause for just a minute and just say this. There's like a wave going through our church right now of people interested in adoption. And it is so exciting. I just cannot wait to see what's going to happen with this. Um, he goes on to say this. He says, fill the earth with people and bring them under your control. Rule over the fish in the ocean, the birds in the sky, sky and every animal on earth. Um, I, I got three thoughts I want to I send you home with today before it starts snowing. Number one, being in the image of Christ, you're worth more than you think you are. You are worth more than you think you are. I talk with a lot of people, the same a lot of people that President Trump talks about. A lot of people, huge, huge amounts of people. Maybe not right now. I'm kind of taking a break from that. I just really need to focus on my family. Um, but I've had, I've had quite a few people ask to meet with me, and I just haven't been able to uh, do that in this season. Predominantly, every time somebody's asking me about their worth, with hands down, they don't ask it in those terms, but they tell me this. They tell me, these are the choices that I've made. And this is what I'm struggling with as a result of those choices. Without question, what they're essentially telling me is that the things I'm struggling with, with the choices that I've made to validate myself, does God like that or does God not like that? Did that make God happy or did that not make God happy? What we're stuck with is this like this tension of where do I actually find my value? Where do I actually find who I am and the worth that I have as I walk through this life, it's tough, is it not? It's a struggle. And we've got to kind of walk in a, in a consistent daily reminder of, or like an affirmation, yes, you're, you're on, you made a, that was a good step you took today. Or that was a bad step you took today. And that's the kind of the Spirit of God directing us in our lives. We had this problem this week where um, it was really kind of funny. Like for those of you who have kids in, in elementary school especially, I'm not sure how it works after that, but uh, like when your kids do something wrong or there's a, problem or they get in trouble or something, um, we either get a message or a phone call or I don't know what else we would get. But so this week, same day, two phone calls about two different kids. I'm telling you what. And so uh, the one flicked a kid off and then he led the class and teaching them how, what that meant. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I was like, Crystal taught him. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one. And then the other one, another one got caught cheating. And I'm like, just don't get caught cheating. No. <laughs> So, <laughs> that we had enough, like, 
margin. So Chris and I, as she's on, she's laying in bed. I go up and I'm like, you know, we're talking about what do we do with this? How do we, how do we play this? Go, go down through, uh, just line up at the door, you know, we'll call you in when it's your turn, that kind of thing. And, and so, uh, we called the cheater in first and, <laughs> and, uh, talked to them about, um, why would you do this? Why, why are you doing Why are you cheating? I just didn't get, want to get the wrong answer. I'm like, it's not about getting the right or wrong answer. It's about you learning how to do it right. It's, it's about you learning. It's not about right or wrong. Forget that. Your teacher doesn't care whether you do it right or wrong. They want to know that you learned. Can I get a witness teacher? Yes. And so uh, we, we incur- I, I could tell that they were struggling with like self-worth in this moment. And I, I told them, I said, say this, say, I'm smart. And there was this like, this little voice, I'm smart. I'm like, no, tell me, I'm smart. And by the, by the end, I, like three or four times, and I had them just like rolling on the floor in laughter, understanding that I have value whether I get it right or wrong. Like, I, I want them to have a great relationship with teacher, and teacher's not going to have a great relationship with you if you're just going to cheat the whole time. It's just stop cheating. And so we, we validated that, but you and I... We walk through life trying to find ways to cheat our hope because we want it. We desperately want it and we want to figure out how to get it. And if we could just recognize the fact that when we are created in the image of God, he created us with value, with worth. And that's the way he sees us as worthful in that sense. Paul said this in Ephesians 2.10. He says, we've become his poetry. In another translation, he says the word masterpiece. We've become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us, for we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. We don't get to just stand behind him. We stand with him. That's how much he values us. It's not, you know, stand behind me and watch me work. No, it's like stand with me and I'll do it through you. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny, and the good works that we would do to fulfill it. Now, this passage totally parallels uh, or echoes what is said in Psalm 139. It's the exact same thing. It's just a package deal. You got an Old Testament version. You got a New Testament version. It says the same thing. God planned stuff in your future, in your history, in your destiny, all of it. It was created for him on purpose, and he values you just the way you are. So secondly, here's what I need you to understand. Being created in the image of Christ, you have access to more than you thought you did. Part of this, I need to, uh, I just need to read. So bear with me a little bit. I know that becomes a little awkward, but um, this is important. And uh, I feel like the way I wrote it is the way it needs to be said. So can I do that? Okay, good. I was going to do it anyway. The greatest negative effect that took place was the fall of man, just after creation. Sometimes I think we get this image that, you know, in Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. You you know, let me just unpack this a little bit for those of you who may not know and understand, but Genesis chapter 1 are the events of creation, like in in fast fast forward. He just like, bam, 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 bam. In Genesis chapter 2, he actually takes a little bit more time and unpacks this. It's the same thing of creation, just restated another way. So like no time has passed here. Genesis chapter 3, we have this fall of man, where Adam and Eve sinned, okay? By Genesis chapter 5, I think we have a time indicator there. I think it's in Genesis chapter 5, where it says, now Adam was 130 years old, and he had his firstborn son, Seth. That's a long time, right? Now, understand this. I think by Genesis chapter 7, the world is uh, 600, 700 years old. By Genesis chapter 11, the earth is a thousand years old. So I'm trying to give you quantities of time. This isn't like Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. These aren't days in a row. These are epics. This is a, this is a long time. I think, I think I heard when I was in, in a, like a Bible history class back when I was in college, Genesis 1 to Genesis 11 is a thousand years. Genesis 11 to the New Testament is another thousand years. That's, do, do you get that? That's a lot, it's a lot of stuff that just, just fast forward. So it's not that Adam and Eve were created, and then in Genesis chapter 3, you know, the next day, they sinned. No, I would imagine in, in my mind, the way that my mind sees this, 
is that they were created and like they enjoyed this communion with God for a lifetime. 60, 70, 80 years they spent every day with God in the garden where God would come and cook them dinner. And they would have this fellowship with God all the time. And at some point during that season, they're tempted and they chose to sin. And by choosing that, I don't know whether it was, is, is, the question becomes is like, was the definition or the worth they're feeling from God, was it not enough in those moments that they had to choose? They're susceptible to temptation. They choose something else. I have no idea. But it's not that they took their first breath and then they sinned. But after they did, they're banished from that garden. They lost so much privilege. A new system of sacrifice had to be instated with Abraham and Moses. And the world saw death become a reality when God himself sacrificed one of his created animals to build, to create clothing for Adam and Eve. Thousands of years later, Jesus came to solve the problem of that trouble with Christ's death on that cross. And he resolved every conflict, every struggle, and every trouble But here's the deal. You and I are still very much created in the image of God regardless of sin. But I need you to see that just because we're all created in His image doesn't mean that we all resemble the same features. People are different. We look and act, we are are all different. And for some reason, a great many people have gone to a place of trouble because the person next to you isn't exactly like you. Think about the history of our world. People are constantly pushing us for a decision and explainable on the differences of people in our world. Slavery, the world wars, all of it was you and that big group of people isn't just like me, so we're just going to get rid of all of them. You see it? You get it? It's the fact that I don't look at you Like you're also created in the image of God because you don't live just like me. A world is looking for us to create a definition of standard on what's acceptable and what is not. It infiltrates the media we look at today. Every conversation revolves around this. Acceptance of this is the choice I'm going to make. Now, are you going to accept my choice? Declare a side or take a stand. I'm not even sure. I'm not sure that today we're going to ever take a side or declare a stance just because um, here's the thing. The moment that we do, something or someone will arise to show us that we are wrong. Every time. In choosing a side, we end up alienating, alienating some. And when we look at Jesus, he refused love and acceptance to no one. He just loved everyone, regardless of what they look like, what they did, what they chose, the lifestyle they lived. It was just acceptance. He just accepted them, brought them in, gave them hope. So while we refrain from choosing a side today, we will most certainly make a declaration. We declare to be a place where you can come and find hope and healing. I declare that no matter who you are or what your affiliation, your affluence, or your selection that you are welcome in this place. Can I get a witness? I was looking for a little bit more response than that. I realize, here's the thing, I realize that I may be inciting a few more questions in your mind. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Not today. Because that's not what this platform is for. This platform is for offering hope. And we're here to offer hope for everybody. Everything else is just a conversation. Let's just declare a stand that we'll just love the people that walk in the door. We'll talk about everything else. Can we do that? Can we understand that? Colossians, Paul wrote this in Colossians. He says, you've acquired a new creation life which is being continually renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. You see, you and I, we haven't arrived yet. We're not there. We work on this a day at a time. He says, giving you the full revelation of God in this new creation life, your nationality makes no difference or your ethnicity, education, or economic status. They matter nothing. For it is Christ that means everything. And he, and as he lives, as he lives in every one of us. For it is Christ that means everything as he lives in every one of us. But the reality is back at the beginning of that. 
But you have acquired, acquired a new creation life, which is continually being renewed into the likeness of the one who created you. Honestly, church, that's what we need to pray for. It's not, they don't look like me. They do it different than I do. They do it wrong. We're drawing a line in the sand and we're saying, I'm right and you're wrong. And the, the, the quest that you and I are on is God, just renew me into what you want me to be and renew them too. What if we just made that our focus? Instead of saying that, you know, instead of saying choose a side, declare a stance, take a side. What if we just said, God, I'm not perfect. I, I need to be renewed a little bit more today than yesterday. And clearly they do too, but maybe more than them, more, maybe more me than them. Third thing I want you to understand as we wrap this up today, because of your created image in Christ, he's not going to abandon you like you thought he would. He's just going to accept you. He just loves you that much. You're created in his image, and that's enough. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 8. Listen, if you are feeling defeated today, abandoned, whatever your thing is that you need some encouragement on, Romans chapter 8 is your chapter. Read it, memorize it, bleed it. Again, today, tomorrow, the next day, it is so uplifting. Paul wrote this. He says, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that's about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on a tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. They're looking at you. They're standing up looking, what, what, how's he going to react to this thing in his life? They're looking at you for that, wondering how does a person who quantifies his life by, I'm a, I'm a child of God, how are they going to react to the suffering that God's putting them through today? They want to know, how do I have hope? For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the freedom, the wonderful freedom, coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and the groaning of creation as if it were in the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status of God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. For this is the hope of our salvation, to be renewed. That's what he's talking about, to be restored. And that's not your job, that's your prayer. God, just make me the way that you want me to be. Perfect me, because I can't do anything about that. Perfect me. And as you're perfecting me, God, perfect them too. That's our, that's our determination. We can't affect anything else. Than, than, than that, than my own heart. God, just restore me as you restore them too. Man, I want to invite you into that moment today. That This whole idea of you being created in the image of God, I, I'm not really so sure I care about your understanding of it. I want you to understand that the rest of the world is created that way too. Does that make sense? Does, it, does that, do you understand that? That the person, the people that you just can't stand they're created just like God, just like you. I, I want to give you an opportunity right now to just kind of put this in front of God. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to remind you of Ephesians 2.10. I just read this a minute ago. We have become his poetry, his masterpiece, or recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the works of good works we would do to fulfill it. And I want to just ask you to make this your prayer, your petition in front of God. God, help me see people that way. Help me see people that they're created in, in your image just like I am, that they are a masterpiece just like I am. I guess the way that I've been praying this throughout the week is God restore me image of, in the image of Christ and help me to see everyone else that way too. But for somebody else that's here today and um, this is new to you, you're, you're just new to this idea, I, I just, honestly, we've been praying that God would help people understand his love and his affection for them. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus today, I want to offer that to you. I want to help you understand how simple and easy that is. 
know and understand that we are born with a disease called sin. There's no way to avoid it. It comes as part as every one of us. And because of that disease called sin, you've got to do something about it. It's a problem. It's a, it's a deficiency in your world and you can't do anything to fix it other than accept what Christ did for you. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if we confess in our mouth that God raised him from the dead and believe in our heart that we would be saved. It's the simplest, it's the, it's the simple element of salvation. And I want to offer that to you today. If that's your story, if that's your life, if that's the decision you need to make, would you just pray with me and say, God, I believe that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior and that you're my Savior. I believe that you sent Jesus to come and die on a cross for me. And I accept that gift of salvation today. In Jesus' name. Take some time this week to reflect on this message. In a journal or with some friends, share some examples of how a positive or negative statement from someone else has impacted what you believe about yourself. Reread Genesis 1, 26-28 and write down or share three distinct truths from Scripture about your identity. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Grand Point Church Podcast. Your next step starts here. To learn more about us, visit grandpoint.church or connect with us on Facebook or Instagram at Grand Point Church. And hey, if you're enjoying this podcast, we would love for you to leave us a review on iTunes, even if that's not where you usually listen. It helps other people find us so they can take their next steps too. We'll see you next week. 